Okay, let's uh, take a quick look here at some things. Okay, uh, I've got the function f of x equals 1x squared graphed on the calculator. First of all, this, this kind of shows you the limitations of the calculator. The resolution just isn't very good on the screen, and so, I mean, it's trying to show me an asymptote there. It doesn't do a very good job. That's what it's trying to do. Uh, based on the graph here, I, I want to I go a little further than we did before. Recall that we said that if we take a limit analytically, we were going to get one of three kinds of answers, right? We're going to get either an answer, we get a number answer, and we're done. What are the other two possibilities? We're going to get no limit, right, which, which came from what? Zero on the bottom, okay. Uh, and that, that gave us an asymptote, right? Or we get the indeterminate form, the zero over zero. We spent a lot of time talking about that. So which, which category does this fall into then? No limit, right. And, and we've, we've talked about how it is that, actually that's not one over x squared, is it? It's one over, what is it? Can you tell me? If the asymptote is on... I think that's supposed to be three. So what is it? Ah, there you go. Good. One over x, the quantity x minus three squared. There we go. So this is one where when x is three, if I try to take this limit, this is one that we would have called a no limit answer, wouldn't we? Right? Uh, and that's true. There is no limit there. Let's get a little more specific, though. By saying it's no limit, we're implying there's an asymptote. But what is actually going on there? As an ant approaches x equals 3 from either side, where is he going? Going up, yeah. And so in a way, we could be more specific about this by saying he's not approaching a number. But what, well, you tell me, what, what's he approaching? What's his y value approaching as he approaches 3? Yeah, positive infinity, isn't it? And we can see that from the graph, right? He's just going to he's going to keep climbing without limit. And so this is this is a, a more detailed and informative way of saying no limit, right? We did this based on a graph. Now, what if we don't have a graph? Is there a way that we could come up with with the same answer, a little improvement over our no limit response? without the benefit of a graph. Okay, let's take a look here. See if we can do this. What if we were to take something like this guy? How about if we take limit of 1 over x minus 2, as x approaches 2, that's going to give me my 1 over 0, which is a no limit. But if we break this down to two one-sided limits, we can be more specific. Instead of just saying as x approaches 2, let's say the limit of 1 <coughs> over x minus 2 as x approaches 2 from the left. Now, what does that mean again, that minus sign? Okay, I'm coming from the left. So what kinds of values would the ant be walking on as he's approaching 2 from the left? Negative 0. Okay, so negative 0, then 1. And he get, as he gets really close, it might look like 1.9, and then 1.99, and 1.999. But they're numbers that are slightly less than 2, and that's almost how we want to think about it. Okay. So now, what am I going to get on the bottom? What kind of a number am I going to get if I subtract 2 from a 
a number that is slightly less than two. Slightly negative. Slightly negative, aren't I? Right? Does that make sense? Because I'm taking two away from something like 1.999, etc. Right? So I'm going to get an answer back that is very close to zero, but how can I label that zero to imply that it's not actually zero, but it's just a, it's close to it, but it's actually negative? <coughs> how, about, how about if I do that? Okay, and, and, and by the way, this is not mathematically rigorous. This is kind of just something that I do, but I think, this, I think you'll like this. I think it's helpful. Uh, this means that it's a number close to zero, but it's not. It's actually a little bit less than that. So it's a very, very small negative number. Now, what's going to happen if I divide a constant value like 1 by a vanishingly small negative number on the bottom? What's going to happen to the fraction as a whole? It's going to be negative. It's going to be really big, isn't it? So couldn't we just say something like that? <coughs> See how that works? Okay, let me, let me just walk through that one more time. So we're saying, now let's look at what this implies. The limit as x approaches 2 from values slightly less than 2 from the left. You all told me that 1 over x minus 2 is going to reduce to something like 1 over a small negative number then. Right? And all we want to know is, what's the behavior of that? Now, you can't tell me a finite value because the number on the bottom is not fixed. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller without limit, right? If the top of the fraction stays static, it's staying at 1, and the bottom of the fraction is getting smaller and smaller and smaller without limit, then that means that the size of the fraction is getting big without limit. It's exploding. But the sign is going to be negative. Because I've got a positive number divided by a negative number, and we all know what that does, right? So that tells us something important. That tells us that as the ant approaches this asymptote at 2, from the left, he's plunging down towards negative infinity, right? Previously, we would have just said no limit, right? Now, this is much better. <clears throat> now, let's look at the other side. This time, let's approach 2 from the right. So a value slightly bigger than 2, 2.0001 or something like that, right? What's this going to look like then if I try to evaluate this? Yeah, if I want on the top, and on the bottom, I'm going to get something that's very slightly positive. So what does that imply? Yeah. So we didn't need a graph, and yet we just extracted what is the asymptotic behavior? Now, that's pretty important. I mean, if we, if we want to end up being able to get an idea of what the behavior of the function is, and that's a lot of what we do in calculus. We're going to do a big section, sort of a cumulative section, you know, around Christmas time-ish, uh, where this is all we do. I mean, we're just trying to get be able to sketch a curve, including asymptotes and local extrema and points of inflection and all that stuff we haven't talked about yet, but, but this is a really big part of it. Asymptotes are a major behavior of a function. So, so this is pretty nice for us to be able to, to do this. If I did have to sketch this then, here's our asymptote. Out, whoops, is it two? Oh, yeah, two, right? We know that the function is doing this from the left. We're doing that, right? And from the right, as we back up towards the function, it's doing that. Right? Make sense? Okay. about that one? Think about that one a little bit. Predictions. As I approach 2 from negative 2, should be right. 
as I approach negative 2 from the left. So what kinds of numbers would those be? Okay, so let's give an example, slightly less than. So negative 1.9999, is that right? Is that approaching negative 2 from the left? No. Ah, oh, what should it be? Two okay, two okay, like two point something, right? Yeah, because I'm going to be on the number line on the left of negative two, which actually pushes the negative numbers, the absolute values of, of the negative numbers we figured, right? More negative. Uh, so, predictions. What kind of infinity am I going to get out of this one? Negative. See, that's what happened no, last time. It's squared. Ah, but it's squared this time. Uh -huh. So, let, let's take a look at this. If I, if I plug in the number, I'm going to get, and this is kind of important, we can look at this in, in, you know, we can go through this incrementally. As x approaches negative 2 from the left, the sum of x plus 2 is going to be slightly negative, right? I got negative 2 point something minus 2 is negative point something, right? So I get 1 over 0 minus squared. Okay, what happens when I square a negative number? Positive. And, and if I square a very, very small negative number, I just get a very, very small positive number, right? So this, in, in effect, just looks like 1 over 0 plus, doesn't it? Right? And so I end up getting positive infinity. And I'm going to get the same thing, aren't I? Because, because I've got that squared there, I know it's going to be positive, right? And so I can see that I'm going to get the same behavior as I approach negative 2 from the right. And so if I had to sketch this one, this one's doing this, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, what about this now? Slightly different problem. What if I want to find all vertical asymptotes? and holes. asymptotes and holes. Now talk to me about that quick before we jump into this. Now once you get in this habit, don't just, you guys are, I know you're smart people, always want to get the job done quickly. Before you jump into problems, it's, as you move through math and physics and things like that, take a second and just force yourself to pause and think about it a little bit. Wrap your brain around the problem and be strategic. Don't just jump in. Yes? Repeat the facts at the top of the bottom of Ah, okay, yeah, maybe, right. So, in other words, what, what are we getting at here? What's, how do we recognize the existence of a hole or a vertical asymptote? How are they different and how would we find them? Vertical asymptotes divided by zero. So okay, vertical asymptotes are divided by zero, but there's, that's right, but there's one other key ingredient there that exists for a vertical asymptote. Let's just say hypothetically there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 17. So if I evaluate the function at x equals 17, I'm getting zero on the bottom, right? What am I getting on the top? A real number. Something other than zero, right? So vertical asymptotes, we could say, and the book summarizes this probably better than I do, but uh, a vertical asymptote is going to be a place where if for a certain value of x, we're going to have a zero of the denominator, but not the numerator, right? Now contrast that with a hole. What's going to happen in a hole? A hole is going to be the same. Yeah, a hole is zero. Zero on top and bottom, good. Okay, so that's going to be a place, that's going to be an x value, where we get zeros of the numerator and the denominator simultaneously. And we've already had some experience with that. We talked about removable discontinuities, right? We talked about those limits. Uh, and, and, and even going back to when we spent all that time talking about uh, indeterminate forms of limits. 
Remember what our trick was. Our trick was we were going to mathematically cancel factors <coughs> on the top and bottom. And what that amounted to was filling in a hole, right? Filling in a hole so we could take the limit more easily. We could take it just by direct evaluation. Okay, so then, yeah, so our goal here then is just to factor this thing and see where we get common factors top and bottom and where we get factors of the bottom that are not factors at the top. So what does the top factor into? X plus two. And what's the bottom factor into? X minus two. Okay, so then what's what kind of interesting interesting stuff is going on here? Tell me about this. Somebody identify something interesting about this function. Okay, so so then I'm seeing that we've got this. What's that tell us? Tell me, what's that telling us? If we can cancel those, what's happening at negative two? Zero. Okay, so what is that? What 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 feature of the function do we do? Do we have at x equals negative two? That's a hole, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Good. Because I've got a zero top and bottom. So at x equals negative two, we have a hole. Okay. Okay. What's another? Somebody else tell me something interesting about this function. Um, at x, at positive three, there's a first class. Okay. Good. We have a vertical asymptote at x equals three, right? Because x equals three is where we're going to have a zero on the bottom, but not the top. If I try to evaluate this function at x equals three. I'm getting some number on the top divided by zero, right? So, okay. Maybe something slightly less interesting, but you can tell me one other thing about this function. I'm not sure what it means exactly, but if you were to have x equals two, would you get a negative on the bottom? Okay, if we have x equals two, we're going to get a negative number on the bottom and what on top? Zero. So what's that mean? It's the value. Say it again. No, not exactly. Now this is this goes back to you guys are making this more difficult than it is. This goes back to you know, like maybe algebra one. If if I know that what's this mean? <coughs> if f of two equals zero, what's going on there? That just means I've got a point with coordinates two zero. What kind of point is that on a function? Okay, it's a, what kind of intercept? Y. <laughs> right? Because if y, if y is zero, that that's just an x-intercept. It's just a, or we might call it a zero of the function, right? X-intercept or zero. So you were trying to find something tricky, and it's just that's just old stuff. So we know we have a zero. Or we might call it an x-intercept at x equals 2. Not that that's as impressive as this other stuff, probably, but it's something, right? Okay? Make sense? All right. Okay, there's one other thing I kind of wanted to be really tricky about in review. Yes, I wanted to, uh, I'll, I'll, I was going to sneak this in, but I'll tell you in advance. Same question for this one. So find vertical asymptotes and holes for this function. Once again, what's our strategy here? We want to find holes. Go ahead, start the factor, right? Okay, but what's the problem with the, with the bottom? It's cubic. Okay. Now let's talk about that for a second. There are ways, and in my years of teaching pre-calculus, I always, in the past, kind of enjoyed the geekiness of being able to find uh, zeros of polynomials using some some tricks, but Increasingly, 
Don't worry about that anymore. Because it's kind of a vanishing, it's, got, it's not valuable anymore. How do we find zeros of big, ugly functions now? Yeah. We just, with, with technology, we just generally, we just generally graph stuff, right? Or find the zeros that way. There are ways for us to, to find zeros of, of polynomials, but they're time consuming and kind of tricky. And so, you know, you know, like I say, maybe if we have time at the end, we'll go back and, and, and take a look at some of these, maybe not as useful, but still kind of interesting theorems. I, 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 I doubt you guys talked about that last year. Is that right? Yeah, and that's okay. I mean, you're not gonna use it much anyway. Uh, but practically speaking, if we're gonna be very pragmatic about this, how could you tackle this problem? And, and this, there really is some strategy. What do you think? Oh, the bottom, I would just move it. So I would back out x squared. Oh, okay, and, and you actually saw something there that's gonna work in this case. We could group the bottom, that's very good. And, and what did you notice about the bottom that, that, that told you that grouping would be good? I like that. I wasn't expecting that answer, but that's a good one. Well, I just tried it when I saw the x to the third, and it gets x plus 2 in both of them. Okay, good. Yeah, you can see here, and maybe the signature of that, kind of the thumbprint is, look at the coefficients. If I look at the first two terms and the second two terms, check out the coefficients. I get 1, 2, and 1, 2, right? And that's a good sign that grouping would work. And so we actually could sneak around this one, and, and, and we could group this and factor it. Now let's just pretend for a second, that's, that's actually very good. Pretend for a second that, that we couldn't group this one. And I hate to say that because that was so cool. Where we actually can't do the bottom one. But it's, it, we sort of lucked out. What if we could? There's still a strategy here that might be useful to us. Now we're trying to find vertical asymptotes and holes, right? Mm -hmm. Holes are where we have zeros at the top and bottom. So which of those two in this case should we probably look for first? Because we, we know the zeros at the top. Ah, good. Okay. Because we know the zeros at the top because that's easy to factor, right? And so if we're going to look for the holes anyway, where it, it's not that easy for us to just start from scratch and factor a big polynomial, it is easy for us to check for solutions of a polynomial, right? Check for zeros. So let's factor the top of this guy. And you've already told me once today that this is just a difference of squares. That's what we get on the top. Now the question is, are any of those zeros at the bottom? What's the easiest way to check? On the bottom? Okay, maybe, but I mean, but but how? How am I going to check the bottom? I'm, I want to want you guys to think about this is not this is just kind of analysis stuff, sort of pre-calculus stuff, but it's good to be thinking about these issues. What's the easiest? A lot of ways we could do it. How do I check and see if any of those are zeros? Just give me a way that works for now. Maybe we can improve on it. The advice has been easier. Plug them in. Plug them in. What am I going to get back for an answer if it's a zero? Zero. Sure. <laughs> exactly. So I could just plug those into the bottom and see, right? And that'll work. Okay. Now, what if they are? What do I do then? How do I factor them out? Good question, huh? <laughs> okay, now I want you to think about something here. Factoring is is, is like dividing, isn't it? Right? If, if I factor something out, I'm, I'm extracting the, 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 the things that are being multiplied together, the factors, right? So for example, if I say, <coughs> I'm gonna leave this example for just a second, we'll come back to it. Let's take an easier one to sort of illustrate a point. What if I have something like this? What if I have x squared minus x minus 2? And I know that that factors into x, what is that, x minus 2, x plus 1? Okay, what if I want to divide this thing through by x minus 2? What's my answer going to be? X plus 1. X plus 1, right? If I divide both sides through by x minus 2, the x minus 2's cancel. And so in effect, factoring really was dividing, wasn't it? They're, they're the same thing. They're the same process. Okay. So if I could just divide out from the bottom one of these two things, I have factored the bottom. Okay. Make sense? How do I, now here comes this is what I know that this is what I'm going to do. How do we divide a polynomial like that though on the top? 
top. We got two ways, and this is going back a ways, and this is <coughs> because I'm not, people aren't just leaping to answer this. I can see that this is not misplaced review. This is probably a good review. We can use long polynomial division, right? Oh, people are just yeah. I can see we need a little review. Long polynomial division, or in some cases we can take a good shortcut and do what? Synthetic division, right? Okay. So now here's another question. I'm going to make you do both of those in plenty this year. Really the uh, but for now, let's just try to be as uh, as we can. When do we get to take the shortcut of synthetic division? Do you remember? There's some cases where we're just stuck with long division. What are the cases where we can actually can do synthetic division? Uh, well, we don't know that yet. We get a remainder either time. Okay. Yes, when we're dividing by a linear factor. If we're dividing by something that is quadratic or bigger, then we must use long division. But if we're just dividing by a linear factor, it, it's very simple and easy for us to, to just use synthetic division. Now, in this case, <clears throat> we're going to divide the bottom by each of these two linear factors and see if they work, right? Because, by the way, it's quicker for us, it's honestly quicker to use synthetic division to check to see if it's a zero than it is to plug numbers in. It's that easy, right? But at the same time, we're actually doing the division. That's a lot of talk. Let's just do this, and I think it'll make sense. So let's divide the bottom then synthetically. Let's divide that by these by one of these two things. And let, let's do this problem. Let's do x cubed plus 2x squared plus x plus 2 divided by, how about if we try x minus 2 first? How do I do that synthetically? I'll start you off. There's our bracket. OK, good. I need the coefficients of the numerator up here, right? OK, there you go. 1, 2, 1, 2. I need the coefficients of the, of the numerator, right? The big polynomial. Now, what if I had been missing an x squared? What would I have to do there? Zero. Got to got to have a zero. So I have to represent all powers of x, including the constant. So you know right away that if this is a cubic polynomial, a, a third degree polynomial, I'm going to have to have how many coefficients? Four. Four. One for each power of x plus the constant, right? So I'm going to get a one, a two a 1 and a 2, right? And then here's my remainder box. If it's a 0, what's going to show up in there? 0, yeah, no remainder. And what goes out front? Uh, the 0 of the bottom, good. Not negative 2, but 2. The 0 of the denominator, if I set it equal to 0 and solve. OK, and how did this work? Yeah, bring, I, I, I seed the process. I'm going to start the ball rolling here by pushing the first coefficient down. And now I just do the same thing. 2 times 1 is 2. Do I add or subtract? Add. You do, now here's how you remember it. Here's how you remember it, because these are easy to confuse. With long division, of course you subtract, right? The way you did back in the day in grade school with long division of numbers, too. Same thing with polynomials. You always subtract subtract polynomials, right, to see what the remainder is for each step of long division. And we'll see some of that later. I have time today. But you do the opposite with synthetic division. You add. So 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 times 4 is, is this going to work? No. no. Clearly, it's not going to work. Let's, we can just quit. We know we're not going to get 0. <coughs> okay, so let's go back. Oops, too far. And let's make that a negative 2. We're gonna, we're now we'll check the other one, right? We'll check, we'll divide by x plus 2. Okay, let's try that. So I'll pop the 1 down, start the ball rolling. Negative 2 times 1 is add those up and I get 0. Now this is better already, isn't it? Because before we were just getting bigger and bigger numbers. Yeah, this is already better. Negative 2 times 0 is 0 plus 1. Negative 2 times 1, 
We got it, right? Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, good, good. So these are the coefficients, aren't they, of, of, uh, of that yeah. quotient. Now, the best way to do this, in my opinion, is, is start from the back. Because it's, you don't, like, if you get a really big answer, it's hard to tell immediately what power that polynomial is. But you know that's the constant always, right? Yeah. Power of x, power of x squared, power of x cubed, if we kept going, right? So we've got an x squared plus zero, plus one here, right? So we could rewrite this then as x squared plus one. And if I multiply both sides by x plus two, I've got this thing factored, right? So I now know that the bottom is equal to x squared plus one times x plus two, right? And the top is just x minus two times x plus two, right? How about that? That's pretty good. And so what can you tell me now about this function? Say it again. They're, they cancel. So what's that? So what's going on then at x equals negative two? There's a hole. Good. There's a hole at x equals negative two. Those guys cancel. Now what about the rest of this thing? What about that factor on the bottom, x squared plus one? Now that's quadratic, so we don't have to worry about doing anything fancy anymore. We can always find the zeros of that. How? What's our race in the hole for quadratics? Quadratic formula. Sure, if we want to find the zeros of that, we can just set it equal to zero and solve using the quadratic formula, right? Uh, can you tell me, though, without even doing that, and that would certainly work, is that going to have any real zeros? It's, it's x squared plus 1. Same thing as saying x squared plus 1 squared. Okay. I'm seeing some people shaking their heads. There are no zeros there. That's right. That's not going to have any real zeros. Now, what are some reasons? Defend yourselves. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll put any number in x to be squared or to be positive. That's a great way to look at it. If I put any number in for x, it's going to, when I square it, it's going to be what? It's going to be positive or, at the very smallest, yeah. zero. So we'd say, now the mathematical word for that is it's non-negative. So it includes zero. And so if that number is non-negative and we're adding one to it, that's always going to be positive valued, isn't it? The denominator. There's no way that could ever go to zero. That's a great way to look at it. Okay? There's one way. What's another thing we could have seen that, that would have shown us that that can't have any zeros? Now, I'm, going to give you a, I'm thinking in terms of patterns. If you look at factoring patterns, for polynomials going back to algebra two. I know this is I'm dredging up some memories here. Uh, we had patterns for a difference of cubes, that factored, right? We had a pattern for a, a, a sum of cubes, but for squares, we only have a factoring pattern for a difference of squares. There is no sum of squares pattern, right? You know that when you ever see a sum of squares pattern, that automatically doesn't factor, it can't. Alden had the best one, though. I like that. That's, that's the most analytical way of seeing this. There's one other one I want to remind you of, too, that will work in situations where it's not so easy to see, and that is checking the value of the discriminant. Okay, what's the discriminant? Do you remember? No. If we look at the quadratic formula, there's a dead giveaway for whether the function's going to work or not. If I write down the quadratic formula, remember the song? X equals Very nice. Very nice. Good. Okay. Very nice. No, I hammered that home so hard. Okay, so so now what's the what's the only part of that function that could blow up? Yeah, the square root, because we got two fundamental rules for real numbers. We can't divide by zero, right? But, but, if, but A can't be zero, or this thing wouldn't even be quadratic, right? I mean, it's AX squared plus BX. So that would have just, if A is zero, this is a non-issue. But the other rule is we can't take an even root of a negative number, right? And so the red flag that's popping up here is the square root. So everything under the square root, the sign of that, we don't even care about the value. The sign of that tells us what's going on. If the B squared minus 4AC is positive, 
the square root is giving us back a number, right? A real number. And so we're going to get two answers, one for the plus and one for the minus. <coughs> right? I get two real roots. If the number under the square root is exactly 0, the square root of 0 is 0, then I get one answer back, a double root, right? Because adding or subtracting 0 in the numerator doesn't change anything. Those are our two identical answers. But maybe most interesting of all, if the b squared minus 4ac is negative, we're guaranteed that this thing blows up. We're going to get imaginary results, right? No real answers. And so we could always just look at this thing and say, well, what's the sign of the discriminant, the b squared minus 4ac? And in this case, a is what? 1, b is 0, c is 1. And so b squared minus 4ac is obviously negative. I'm going to get 0 minus uh, 4 times a positive times a positive. 0 minus some positive number is definitely negative, right? We don't even care what it is. We just know it's negative, and so there's no real results. Okay? So we got this thing resolved. And I snuck in a bunch of good review there without even, that was pretty well disguised. Huh? So we know that we have a hole at negative 2. And there is no vertical asymptote because there's no other real zero in the denominator. OK? Make sense? All right. All right. That's probably enough math on a Friday. Okay, for bragging rights going into the weekend here, and this is badge of honor you carry all weekend. It's a line. Very good. <laughs> okay, we'll just split the class right here. And half of you are going to walk out hanging your head all weekend, half of you are just going to be all pumped up. We're going to do a little, have a little animal facts here. So, yeah. so we got this half versus this half. We're going straight up uh, speed round here, going by hands. If, but only one, if your team answers wrong, if, if, if a member of your team answers wrong, the other team gets unlimited guesses. Okay, so animal facts. We're going to go, uh, I want to know what is by height or weight, what is the largest bear in the world? Kodiak. No. 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 <laughs> The polar bear it is.